Hi, everyone. Uh, so we're going to get started. Sorry for the technical difficulties. Uh, sounds like some of the stuff was uh, uncharged out of battery. So I think we're good to go now. Um, so I'm Charlene Haver. I'm the Methods Platform Lead at Skipper, which is the Saskatchewan Centre for Patient-Oriented Research. Skipper is funded by CIHR, which is the Canadian Institutes for Health Research. Um, part of my role is to advance research methodologies to support patient-oriented research, and this is really why Skipper is hosting this workshop today with the Clinical Trial Support Unit uh, with Scott Corley. So uh, the Clinical Trial Support Unit is one of Skipper's affiliated labs, and they're a partner to Skipper. So thanks so much, Scott, for working with us on this presentation. Uh, for anyone dialed into WebEx, if you could mute yourself, if you're not already muted, that would be great, just so we don't get feedback. Uh, at this time, I'd like to take this opportunity to acknowledge that we're meeting today on the traditional territory of numerous First Nations and the homeland of the Métis people. Saskatoon is located on Treaty 6 territory, and we recognize and understand that the relationship between Skipper and the Indigenous peoples of this land is guided by the treaty relationship. I was born and raised on Treaty 6 territory near Melfort, Saskatchewan, and continue to reside on Treaty 6 territory in Saskatoon. I'm thankful for having Skipper host our event on this land today. So the structure of the workshop will be a formal presentation by Scott Corley, followed by an activity. And this workshop is scheduled until 2.30 p.m. The slides will be distributed after the presentation along with the survey to get your feedback on how things went today. Uh, for any person attendees needing the washroom, you need to head out the room, turn left, and then there's some green posts kind of halfway down the hall, turn right through the double doors, and that's where the bathrooms are. So I'm just going to start today by telling you a little bit about Skipper, if you aren't already familiar with what we do. Um, we help support patient-oriented research for researchers, patients, health system, clinicians, any decision makers. Um, and part of what we do is help out with recruiting patient family advisors. So uh, in the back of the room today is Mallory Keller, our patient engagement lead. So if any research teams, uh, if you can wave again, Mallory, if any research teams need help engaging patients, Mallory is your go-to person. Skipper can also help fund students doing patient-oriented research. In the room today is Christine Stobart. If you just want to wave your hand, Christine, if you need help with uh, getting any students funded to do patient-oriented research, Christine is your go-to person. Um, Skipper can also provide consultations to access provincial databases via uh, eHealth Saskatchewan and our Health Quality Council. We offer patient-oriented research training called support module training and training how to build research relationships with Indigenous communities. We also have a new network of researchers doing patient-oriented research called the Affiliated Researcher Alliance. I see some of the members in the audience today, so thank you for coming. If anyone's interested in being a member, you can just let me know. And we also host learning events and workshops like the one we're at today. Uh, for more information about any of the Skipper supports or how we can help you, you can go to our website at skipper.ca or you could talk to any of the staff. So our presenter today is Scott Corley and he'll be presenting on pragmatic clinical trials. So just to know a little bit about Scott, he has over 25 years experience in clinical trial management, data management, and he joined the U of S uh, in 2010. Prior to moving to Saskatchewan, Scott held research positions in Seattle, Washington, including the University of Washington Department of Biostatistics, Axial Research Corporation, and Cancer Research and Biostatistics. He's worked on, on large clinical trials funded by the U.S. Nas National Institutes of Health, as well as industry-sponsored research. And Scott is currently the director of the Clinical Trial Support Unit and has been in that role since 2012. So please join me in welcoming Scott Corley. Thank you very much, Charlene. And I need to be ambidextrous here. I've got to advance the slides with one hand and talk in the microphone so uh, people online can hear me. So thanks for coming, everyone. Appreciate you coming. Thanks for, to everybody online for joining us. And today, indeed, is going to be, it's going to be a clinical trials day. I was telling to Christine when we were kind of planning this talk that I'm a clinical trials nerd and I find this really interesting. I hope you find it at least a little interesting. You know, we're going to get down in the weeds a bit. Um, and so this may be review for many or all of you, but we'll, we'll see how it goes. Hopefully it won't be too repetitive. So, um, so I'm going to talk about pragmatic clinical trials. 
uh, which are also called real world clinical trials, although pragmatic is the term that's used uh, most of the time these days. Um, okay, here's the ambidextrous part. Okay, just to, uh, before we get started, just to uh, touch on the uh, clinical trial support unit, the CTSU is a unit of the College of Medicine, but in addition to supporting clinical and patient-oriented researchers at the U of S, we also work with the Saskatchewan Health Authority and the Saskatchewan Cancer Agency uh, in supporting clinical and patient-oriented researchers. Uh, the CTSU also supports Skipper's real-world clinical trials core component, and we also provide uh, support to uh, Skipper's Affiliated Research Alliance and Sprout Grant applicants. And in a quick nutshell, our services, we can advise on, um, on uh, clinical research designs, including traditional and pragmatic, as well as protocol development, budgets, uh, ethics, complying with regulations, uh, data management, and conducting your studies as efficiently as possible. We also have people, many of them here, who uh, do the work, and they can help you get your studies up and running and carry them out. And we do research ethics and operational approval applications. Uh, we can help develop the protocol. We do Health Canada clinical trial applications, uh, contracts, budgets. We have people who can coordinate your studies, do the day-to-day -day activities. And uh, we provide data management services and clinical trial monitoring. So that's the CTSU in a nutshell. So for topics, um, before we talk about pragmatic clinical trials, we have to talk about the principles of traditional clinical trials and then contrast them. So we're going to start by um, uh, talking about the attributes of traditional randomized controlled trials, or RCTs, and then, uh, and then I'll compare pragmatic trials to traditional RCTs. Uh, I'll go into a little more detail about the features of pragmatic trials and then um, talk about, a little bit about a pragmatic approach to pra pragmatic trials and then give a couple of examples of both traditional and uh, pragmatic trials. So, um, can everyone hear me? Is everyone hearing me in the back? Okay, good. Um, so, to set the stage for this, um, there's gonna be a quiz. And uh, if uh, I gave a similar talk a few years ago to Skipper, so if by any chance any of you we're at that talk. Please don't answer because you would have heard this before. I'm looking at Mallory back there. She might have been there. <laughs> and um, so, the, okay, the quiz question is, who conducted the first clinical trial? I know we have a lot of clinical trial nerds here. Yes. Do you remember who that was? Oh, very good. Adiola and uh, Rashmi, very good. Um, actually, there is a reference to King Nebuchadnezzar in the book of Daniel in the Bible, actually, that uh, has been mentioned as resembling a clinical trial. That's a pretty big stretch, though. So, in, indeed, uh, the first controlled clinical trial of the modern era is considered to have been conducted by Dr. James Lynn. And uh, while working as a surgeon, on the uh, ship Salisbury in the British Navy, Dr. Lin was appalled by the high mortality that he was observing from scurvy among the sailors. So in 1747, Dr. Lin conducted a comparative trial of the most promising cures for scurvy. And his study contained important elements of a controlled clinical trial. And also very nicely, he carefully and vividly documented his trial. So in Dr. Lin's words, I selected 12 patients in the scurvy. Their cases were as similar as I could have them. They all in general had putrid gums, the spots and lassitude with weakness of the knees. They lay together in one place being a proper apartment for the sick in the forehold and had one diet common to all. That is water gruel sweetened with sugar in the morning, fresh mutton broth, oftentimes for dinner, at other times light puddings, boiled biscuit with sugar, etc. And for supper, barley and raisins, rice and currants, sago and wine, or the like. And for the interventions, two were ordered each a quart of cider a day. Two others took 25 drops of elixir vitriol three times a day. Two others took two spoonfuls of vinegar three times a day. Two of the worst patients were put on a course of seawater. Two others had each two oranges and one lemon given them every day. 
The two remaining patients took an electory recommended by the hospital surgeon. So we can see controls that Dr. Lind included in his experiment. The, partic the participant, he selected participants whose cases were as similar as possible. Um, he divided the participants into groups, each receiving a different intervention or treatment, which he followed and then followed them for outcomes. Uh, he placed all of the participants in the same location on the ship. That was an apartment in the forehold. And he controlled their food intake so that all of the participants received the same basic diet. So by controlling these variables, he was able to make conclusions about the effects of the interventions, which was the factor that he intentionally varied. So for the outcome, again, in Dr. Lin's words, the consequence was that the most sudden and visible good effects were perceived from the use of oranges and lemons, one of those who had taken them being at the end of six days fit for duty, the other was the best recovered of any in his condition and was appointed to attend the rest of the sick. So uh, we might say the rest is history, but actually uh, because oranges and lemons were expensive, it took the British Navy 50 years to make lemon juice a compulsory part of the sailor's diet. So traditional randomized control clinical trials have been called the gold standard for evaluating the effectiveness of medical interventions. So let's talk about the, the key features of traditional RCTs. And they include defined eligibility criteria for patient selection, randomization, control groups, blinding, and sufficient sample size. So let's talk about each of these in turn, starting with eligibility criteria. So um, as most or all of us know, uh, it's important that the study population be defined in advance stating unambiguous inclusion and exclusion criteria or eligibility criteria. And of course, these eligibility criteria are characteristics that all participants share. And they can be things such as an age range, uh, specific sex, certain medical histories, or current health status. And in general, the, uh, the eligibility criteria relate to participant safety, keeping the, the trial participants safe and also um, the anticipated effects of the intervention. So typically, uh, people are chosen for whom there's a high likelihood of detecting the hypothesized effects of the intervention. And so by carefully defining the study population and carefully choosing the trial participants, that allows us to detect results in a reasonable period of time, um, uh, given a reasonable number of participants, and a finite amount of funding. Um, so I'm gonna show you a couple of slides uh, related to a clinical trial I worked on as a member of the study team. Um, and this is the AFFIRM study, the atrial, follow, atrial fibrillation follow-up investigation of rhythm management. This was a large clinical trial funded by the US National, National Institutes of Health. There were over 4,000 participants over 200 clinical sites, including the U of S. This was long before I even knew the U of S existed back in Seattle, but um, it's a large trial. And, um, and it was looking at atrial fibrillation, which of course is a common heart arrhythmia. And it's more, as people age, it becomes more common. And uh, a firm compared the two main approaches for treating atrial fibrillation. And the first of these was um, to use electrical cardioversion to restore the heart back to what's called normal sinus rhythm, and then to use antiarrhythmic drugs to try and maintain that normal rhythm. And that was called the rhythm control arm. And the other approach is simply to use uh, rate controlling drugs to try and slow the heart rate down, because when you have atrial fibrillation, your heart tends to beat very fast. So that was called the rate control arm. So rhythm control versus rate control. <clears throat> And this slide shows the eligibility criteria that defined the study population for our firm. So this is an example of eligibility criteria. Notice to be included in the trial, you needed to have atrial fibrillation documented by ECG or rhythm strip, and you needed to be at least 65 years old, or you could be less than 65 if you had at least one other clinical risk factor for stroke. Stroke with atrial fibrillation, stroke is the big risk because your heart beats abnormally, 
clots can form in your heart and a, and a piece of the clot can break off and go up in your brain and cause a stroke. So, um, so these are the various inclusion criteria. Also, patients would, or would be excluded if they had any of a variety of complicating conditions such as valvular heart disease, um, prior valve surgery, um, class four congestive heart failure, and so forth. So an example of eligibility criteria. The next key feature of well-designed clinical trials is randomization. And randomization, of course, um, uh, critical to well-designed uh, uh, clinical trials, uh, RCTs, is, uh, is of course, a, a procedure that randomly assigns participants to one group or the other. And so if it's rate control versus rhythm control, they're randomly assigned to one group or the other. And there's three critical advantages to randomization. Uh, it removes bias, it results in comparable groups, and it ensures statistical validity. So let's drill down a little bit into each of these because they are important. So um, randomization removes potential bias in the allocation of participants to one group or the other. And in a non-randomized study, bias can easily occur because the investigator or the participant might influence the choice of the intervention. And this influence can be conscious or it could be subconscious and it can be due to a variety of factors, including the prognosis of the participant. Well, that builds bias into your study. So say, for example, an investigator maybe even subconsciously thinks one treatment is better than the other, then if they are able to assign participants to a particular group, they may kind of unconsciously assign their sicker patients to their favored treatment. Well, in that case, that could um, result in worse outcomes being attributed to the group with the sicker patients. So in a non-randomized study, bias can easily invalidate the trial results. The second, second critical advantage of randomization is comparable groups. It's related to um, removal of bias. Um, and so in general, randomization tends to produce groups that are the same for important characteristics. And a key thing here is that this can include things you haven't even thought about. You know, you think about, okay, what age do we want? Do we have certain medical histories and so forth? But there's probably things that we haven't even thought about that may be important. And the beauty of randomization is that it tends to balance out the groups for all characteristics. We say the groups are evenly balanced. <clears throat> Back to AFFIRM, this is a table showing the measured baseline characteristics of the participants in the AFFIRM trial. And you can see uh, in the first column here are this list of uh, characteristics. And then we have measurements for the overall, overall participants and then broken down by rate control and rhythm control groups. And you can see they're, they're quite similar. I mean, particularly look at, look at age. The average age in the rate control group was 69.8 versus 69.7 in the rhythm control group. So almost identical, very nicely balanced. We look at female sex, 40.6% uh, were female in the rate control group, 37.9 in the rhythm control group. There's a little different there, but not too bad. And uh, we see uh, as we go down the list of uh, this pattern of similarity. And also there's the p-value column. So that's the result of tests for, for differences, statistical tests for differences between rate and rhythm control for each of the characteristics. If you want to do that as a significance test, then um, of course, if it's less than 0.05, that's a, uh, that could be considered a statistically, statistically significant difference. Notice that all of the p-values except for one are well above the 0.05 cutoff. For female sex, it approaches significance, but it doesn't cross across that cutoff. So these results show that randomization has resulted in highly comparable groups in the AFFIRM trial, very nicely balanced. And the third critical advantage of randomization is that ran randomization guarantees that uh, the validity of st statistical tests of significance. That's a huge topic I won't even attempt to go into because I don't understand that well, but. Um, <clears throat> okay, the next key feature of RCTs is well-designed RCTs is control groups. 
So a sound, clinic, a sound clinical investigation almost always requires that a control group be used against which the intervention of interest is compared. And of course, randomization is the preferred way to assign participants to the control and intervention groups. Control group could be uh, consist of a placebo, or it might be no treatment. Um, it could be the usual or standard of care treatment or some other specified treatment. And of course, we're all familiar with placebos. Uh, placebo is defined as an inactive substance or intervention such as an inactive tablet or even sham surgery that resembles the comparable active substance or intervention. And often, as uh, many of us know here, uh, have had experience with, often it's not just simply the new intervention compared against uh, placebo. Often what happens is both groups get the standard of care and then the new intervention is added in one group and the placebo is added in the other. And that's because often it's not considered ethical to use just a placebo if, if, uh, if it's already been proven that an existing therapy uh, is beneficial. Um, and of course, there's the placebo effect, which is the simple act of receiving a treatment, active or not, may in itself be efficacious because there's an expectation of benefit. Next key feature of well-designed RCTs is blinding. And so a solution to the, blind, to the problem of bias, which again can be conscious or unconscious, is to use blinding. And of course, with blinding, the identity, the uh, participants or the investigators or both are masked to the identity of the assigned intervention. In a single blind trial, only the participants are unaware of the treatment they're receiving or placebo, and in a double blind uh, trial, uh, neither the participants nor the investigators uh, know the identity of the assigned intervention. Ideally, the trial should be double blinded. That is the best, uh, that is the best design. And doing blinding properly takes a lot of work. Uh, that's, it's not easy to blind properly. Uh, you have to take a lot of steps. For example, if you're using tablets, they have to look and taste, even taste the same and you need to code the drug bottles properly. Um, you need to administer the treatments identically to all the participants. And for some trials, such as many surgical trials, it's just not feasible to do blinding. And the last key feature, well-designed clinical trials is sufficient sample size, um, um, which of course is the number of participants in your trial it has to be sufficient to be able to detect differences of clinical importance between the treatments you're comparing. Well, that means statistical power. You need to have enough participants in your trial to have sufficient statistical power to be able to detect mean, clinically meaningful differences. Okay. So, this rigorous experimental design of RCTs has been important in correcting erroneous beliefs about a variety of interventions. And this slide shows uh, treatments that at one time were thought to be beneficial and were later showed to be harmful in RCTs. So uh, exa for example, high dose oxygen therapy and neonates, antiarrhythmic drugs after myocardial infarction or heart attack, uh, fluoride treatment for osteoporosis, and so forth. And the reverse is true as well. This slide shows uh, a couple of treatments that at one time were thought to be harmful and were later shown to be beneficial in RCTs, including beta blockers in heart failure and digoxin after heart attack. So these slides show the importance and power of traditional rigorously designed RCTs. However, over recent decades, there have been increasing concerns by clinicians that traditional randomized controlled trials don't reflect the real world of clinical practice. And the concern is that, um, that the rigorous experimental design results in artif artificial conditions, so including uh, the highly selective recruitment with narrow eligibility criteria, uh, tightly controlled treatment regimens, and they tend to be conducted by experienced clinicians in academic medical centers. So 
the concern is that because they're so tightly controlled, the results of these trials aren't generalizable to the average patient in routine clinical practice. And these concerns were expressed in a ground pa groundbreaking paper published, published by Schwartz and Lelouch in 1967. And uh, Schwartz and Lelouch started the movement to more pragmatic clinical trials. And in their paper, they outlined a strategy to make trials more generalizable to routine clinical practice. And also, they classified trials of, as either what the terms they used was explanatory or pragmatic. And they said that explanatory, explanatory trials are designed to better understand how an intervention works, whereas pragmatic trials were designed to provide information needed to make a decision about treatment options. Bit of a different emphasis here, different focus. And to illustrate these differences, they, uh, they described a hypothetical trial of anti-cancer treatments, which is, uh, which is shown here. So, this is a hypothetical trial, and the idea is that you've got two different treatment approaches, two different, two different groups, and in the first group, the patients receive radiotherapy, but before they get the radiotherapy, they get this drug which is intended to sensitize the patient to the radiotherapy. So the drug has no effect by itself, but all it does is basically make the, it's supposed to make the radiotherapy more effective. The other key thing here is it takes 30 days to administer the, the drug. The other group, group B, just gets radiotherapy. So they said, so Schwartz and Lelouch said there's two ways that you could design this trial. In both designs, and this is shown in this figure here, in both designs, group A is the same. 30 days to, of the sensitizing drug and then radiotherapy. But group B differs. In the first design, you wait 30 days and then you do the radiotherapy. And this makes it directly comparable to group A, right? They're both waiting 30 days to do the radiotherapy. And they said, this is an explanatory approach. In the, in the other approach, however, they're not waiting 30 days to give radiotherapy. They're giving it right away, just as they would in usual practice. And they said, this is a pragmatic approach. <clears throat> So Schwartz and Lelouch point out that neither approach is better than the other. However, they answer different questions. So the explanatory approach provides an assessment of the sensitizing effect of the drug and also may give valuable information at a biological level, level whereas the pragmatic approach compares the treatments under the conditions that would be applied in, in normal clinical practice. And they argue that pragmatic trials provide information that is more generalizable to normal clinical practice than do explanatory trials. And they also argue that traditional RCTs tend to be explanatory rather than pragmatic. And therefore, they argue that uh, traditional RCTs do not provide information generalizable to normal clinical practice. So, um, just fleshing out some of these differences, according to Swartz and Lelouch. Uh, explanatory trials. The objective uh, is focused on, uh, um, on assessing efficacy of the intervention rather than effectiveness in routine practice. The setting is well-resourced. It's, it's an ideal setting. The uh, study population is homogeneous to minimize bias. It's highly selected and poorly adherent participants and those with conditions that might dilute the effect of the intervention are often excluded. Uh, the intervention is standardized and strictly enforced. The outcomes focus on the understanding of the action of the intervention, and often surrogates are used, such as biomarkers or tumor progression. And the relevance to clinical practice is indirect little effort is made to match the trial design to the decision-making needs of those in the usual settings in which the intervention is to be implemented. Pragmatic trials, on the other hand, 
Uh, the objective is to, com is to compare the effectiveness in routine clinical practice, and the setting is routine clinical practice. Um, the study population is heter heterogeneous as to mimic the real world, and there's little or no selection beyond the clinical uh, indication of interest. And the intervention is complex. It mimics routine care with lots of flexibility to change the intervention as needed, and no placebos are used because placebos aren't used in usual clinical practice. And the outcomes are focused on the impact on clinical care, and they're relevant to a variety of stakeholders, including participants, funders, communities, and healthcare practitioners. And the relevance to clinical practice is direct. The trial is, des is designed to meet the needs of those making decisions about treatments in the settings in which the interventions are to be implemented. Uh, something that's discussed in the context of, of, of pragmatic trials is called internal versus external validity. So explanatory trials are said to be in, have high internal validity. That's because the tightly controlled, uh, rigorous experimental design results in, 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 produces reliable and accurate results. So they say they have high internal validity whereas uh, with pragmatic trials are said to have high external validity. In other words, the results are generalizable out in the real world of clinical practice. So just to recap uh, uh, the attributes of pragmatic trials, um, for participant eligibility, everyone with a condition of interest is, uh, can participate. Uh, with the intervention, it's highly flexible as it would be in routine healthcare with no placebos, no blinding, um, and greater freedom for participants as well as healthcare providers to change the in intervention. And uh, the full range of practitioners and settings in which an intervention would be applied are included in the study. And um, there is no measurement of participants' compliance with the study protocol, or if there is measurement, it's unobtrusive, and there are no special strategies to ensure participant adherence. And uh, participant, participant follow-up is similar to what it would be in, in, in standard care. You're trying to mimic standard clinical practice, and so there are no special follow-up visits. And um, the primary outcome um, consists of a broad set of uh, events that are of importance to a variety of stakeholders. Again, participants, funders, communities, practitioners, they can be things such as death, emergency admissions, quality of life, economic impact, and so forth. And the outcomes are assessed in the routine course of healthcare. <clears throat> So pragmatic clinical trials seem to have some distinct advantages over explanatory trials or traditional RCTs in terms of generalizability to routine clinical practice. But let's look at some of the limitations of pragmatic trials. So basically, we're, lo we're loosening things up. We're uh, loosening up the intervention standards. There's no blinding. Um, we're not ensuring participant compliance. Uh, the el eligibility is loosened up a lot, so we're loosening the study design. So what this does, I mean, there's a reason for that r rigorous experimental design. And so what this does is it increases the potential for bias and therefore potentially leading to erroneous results. It also weakens the ability to detect meaningful differences. In other words, it weakens statistical power. So what happens when you weaken statistical power? Well, you need more patients in your trial to uh, beef up the statistical power. So that can mean that pragmatic trials need larger sample sizes, and it also can make them more expensive. And uh, of course, clinical trials are expensive in general, but as an extreme example, this ALHAT antihypertension trial, this enrolled 42, this was a pragmatic trial, it enrolled 42,000 participants, and cost $120 million to complete. This is an example of an extreme pragmatic clinical trial. <clears throat> I also want to talk about what, what I'm calling the generalizability problem. 
and the, uh, the premise behind pragmatic trials is that the results of the trial are more generalizable to routine clinical practice and to the typical patient. But I would argue that there's no such thing as a typical patient. In fact, the results of any study, I mean, you think about it, the results of any study are really calculated on average. And so there's always a question about which individual participants are benefiting from the intervention in the trial. So, um, so in any trial, only a subset of the patients are actually benefiting, and there will always be doubt about who actually benefits. So pragmatic trials, even though they're trying to be more inclusive of the population of patients, they don't solve this problem. You still don't knew, know who's benefiting from the intervention. So um, as Rothwell uh, and colleagues uh, said, the most important thing about a treatment is that it is effective in the individual who's being treated, not merely that it ought to be effective on the basis of the overall result of an RCT or a systematic review. And uh, Canadian researcher David Sackett, who has been called a father of evidence-based medicine, said that doctors don't generalize results, they actually particularize them. So how are we going to determine which patients are benefiting from the interventions in our clinical trials? Well, um, one way to do this, and the conventional way to do this, is through subgroup analysis, where we look at the effect of treatment in different subgroups in our trial population. And subgroup analysis, analysis typically looks at one variable, one variable at a time. For example, how is the treatment affecting women versus men, or young people versus old people, that kind of thing. And one key thing about uh, subgroup analysis, of course, is that it needs to be planned in advance to be valid. It's not valid after a trial is completed to go on a fishing expedition looking for significant differences among your subgroups. That's not statistically valid. So significant limitations of subgroup analysis include the risk of false positives from trans chance fluctuations. In other words, if you're doing a whole bunch of these comparisons, you're likely to get significant differences just by chance when in fact there may be no real clinical difference in, in the actual population. And, and the reverse is true too because when you break your trial population down into these little groups, they're small, smaller groups and so often the sample size is insufficient. You don't have enough statistical power to really detect differences that may actually exist in the population. And, um, and the one variable at a time subgroup anal analyses ignore the fact that patients have multiple factors that interact to influence outcomes and potential treatment benefits. So a promising approach to identify, ident identifying patients who benefit from interventions is called risk stratified analysis. And so rather than looking at one variable at a time, it takes a multivariate approach and it, it assigns trial participants to risk categories based on multiple factors. So, so say for example, uh, and this is related to the, uh, the uh, outcome of interest. So say our outcome of interest is, is uh, MI, heart attack. We look at these different factors, age, uh, age, sex, uh, blood pressure, diabetic versus non-diabetic, and then we assign people to risk categories, so maybe low, moderate, and high. And then we look at the effect of the intervention in our trial on each of these risk categories. This is an interesting approach. Now, this table here is a hypothetical analysis from this paper down here, it's just to kind of show how this works. So here we have our risk categories, the patients in the different risk categories, and, and then we see the rate of bad outcomes. So that can be, say it's, it's heart attack or it's, it's death, whatever. And then we look in the control group and then the intervention group and compare them. So we see overall, we see a 6% rate of bad outcomes in the control group versus 5.2% in the intervention group that's a relative risk reduction of 13.3%. So that's the overall result. But when we, break, when we break this down into risk categories, we see some interesting things. Well, one, in the high-risk group, the benefits of the intervention are greatest. So 
15% in the control group versus 11.5 in the intervention group. That's a 23.3% reduction, a relative risk reduction. Moderate risk group, it's a little less impactful, 10% risk, risk reduction. Look at the low risk group. We have 2.5% in the control group, but it's actually higher. It's a little bit higher in the intervention group, and that's a negative relative risk reduction. In other words, what this is saying, it can be interpreted as, that the benefits of the intervention are being outweighed by the harm caused by the intervention in the low risk group. So this shows how this analysis can provide some really interesting and important information. A key limitation of risk stratified analysis is that it requires validated risk prediction tools for the outcome of interest. In other words, you need to have tools, validated tools for assigning people to these different risk categories for the outcome of interest. So one thing, um, this is like really scratching the surface because this is a really big topic, real world evidence. And this is really gaining a lot of steam um, in the context of pragmatic clinical trials. And real world evidence is, um, is, um, is, is data gathered in the context of clinical care and in-home or community settings versus research intensive or academic environments. So this includes things such as electronic health records, claims databases, uh, electronic devices and apps, uh, registries in clinical practice, and social media. And these increasingly rich data sets are an important source of da data for potential use in research. And uh, there's efforts being made to develop statistical methodologies for use with real world data. And there, and there has been some important uh, progress. Um, but, um, but we have to remember, we have to be careful with the use of real world evidence that um, in remembering that most of these data w weren't collected with the goal of supporting research. So that means that fundamental issues of confounding data quality and bias remain with real world evidence. But there's a lot of effort going into developing processes to work with these data, so it's gonna be interesting to see how this plays out. And there are important questions about privacy, particularly when you're talking about data collected by social media and smartphone apps and so forth. So uh, let's take a step back and take a pragmatic approach to pragmatic trials starting with a reality check. And the reality check is that, uh, in fact, there are no purely explanatory and pragmatic clinical trials. In fact, all trials include attributes of both explanatory and pragmatic trials to one degree or another. Even looking back, like, you know, I worked for I think, nine years on the AFFIRM trial, and looking back on it, now I see, boy, there was a lot of pragmatic attributes of that trial. Um, but the, the uh, most important thing is to find a reasonable balance between explanatory and pragmatic features while maintaining good study design. So a pragmatic trial is not a substitute for good trial design. And randomization is, is essential to good valid trials, whether they're explanatory or pragmatic. As much as possible, we should try to include the types of patients that mirror real life in our trials. And if possible, doing risk stratified analysis is helpful to better determine which participants benefited from the intervention. And of course, subgroup analysis will continue, continue to be used and is a very important tool. And good trial reporting is critical. So by reporting in detail, the trial design, conduct and analysis, that helps practitioners determine the applicability of the trial results to their individual patient. So, um, a pragmatic is, is approach, a pragmatic approach is important for any clinical trial, but nevertheless, trials will continue to vary according to how strong their explanatory or their pragmatic features are. 
and different trials will fall at different locations along the exploratory pragmatic continuum. And there are important roles, and there will continue to be important roles, at each end of the continuum. So, um, so rigorously designed and executed explanatory clinical trials are essential for demonstrating the active efficacy of new interventions, and they provide the foundation for, for, for providing the necessary evidence in the approval of new drugs. So explanatory trials are not going away by any means. At the same time, <clears throat> there will continue to be an important role of highly pragmatic trials for confirming the ex effectiveness of interventions in the broader practice of everyday healthcare. Okay, so um, we're approaching the point where you're gonna get involved. And um, so what we wanna do is we wanna take a research question and look at an explanatory trial addressing that question. And then we wanna talk about a more, maybe a more pragmatic way to address that question, a more pragmatic trial. And um, so, um, and then we'll have you do some brainstorming on, on, pragmatic, on pragmatic features. And then I'll actually show you a trial, a pragmatic trial addressing the same question. And the question is, is it better to take blood pressure medications in the morning or at bedtime? And this is interesting because this, this question came up because it started to be shown that there was some evidence that taking the blood pressure medications at bedtime were resulting in fewer car adverse cardiovascular events. Um, <clears throat> and standard practice has been to have, you know, to have people take their meds in the morning upon awakening. So, um, so we're going to look at these kind of explanatory versus pragmatic. We're also going to use a tool to measure how pragmatic and how explanatory they are. And this is called the Pressy 2 tool. I used to think this was called, it was, you pronounce this precise, but actually I found a video where they're talking about it, the people who created it, and they call it Pressy 2. Uh, Pragmatic Explanatory Continuum Indicator Summary 2. And this tool, this measurement tool, has nine what they call domains. And each domain is scored. You assign a score to each domain, ranging from one to five, from very, very pra explanatory to very pragmatic. And so, um, and so we're going to look at these as you kind of as you kind of brainstorm as well. So, just quickly, we've already talked about these eligibility. How restrictive is the are the eligibility criteria? Are there special steps for recruiting people? How different is it from the routine course of of normal clinical practice? What is the setting? Is it like focused on academic medical centers? Um, what special expertise and resources are needed? Um, how uh, flexible is the delivery of the intervention? Um, and are there measures in place to make sure participants adhere to the intervention? Um, doing so is more explanatory. And how closely are participants followed up? Are there, are there special follow-up visits? And the primary outcome, how re relevant is it to participants and other stakeholders? And finally, in the primary analysis, to what extent are all the data included? including all the data, regardless, is a more pragmatic approach. <clears throat> so first, we'll talk about the explanatory trial, and we'll see how we rate this according to the Pressy 2 tool. So this is the MAPEC study, and this looked at this question. This was conducted in Spain, and it was published in 2010. And um, um, this was the Ambulatory Blood Pressure Monitoring for Prediction of Cardiovascular Events Study, MAPEC. And this was an explanatory trial conducted in Spain studying the influence of circadian time of hypertension treatment on cardiovascular risk. Now, what they found, this trial is, is done, they found that bedtime dosing, people on bedtime dosing had significantly fewer cardiovascular deaths, heart attacks, and strokes. And getting into the uh, statistical details here, there was a hazard ratio of 0.33 with a 95% confidence interval of 0.19 to 0.55 and a very highly statistic, a statistically significant outcome. Basically, what this is saying is that 
The results appeared to show that bedtime dosing reduces major cardiovascular events by more than 50%. That's a striking result, actually, just by changing when you take your meds. So let's see where MAPEC falls along this continuum, the explanatory pragmatic continuum. So I'm going to go quickly through these nine domains for the MAPEC trial. So eligibility criteria. Um, so there's, there's a number of these. Actually, I'm, those of us at CTSU, we see many more than these in many trials. But still, there's a fair number. And also, look at some of the demands being made on the patients here. One is they have to, to be included, they have to wear this 24-hour ambulatory blood pressure monitoring device, ABPM. They have to wear that for two days and, um, and to show that they're hypertensive. The other thing here is that um, patient, people are excluded who uh, seem to be unable to follow all study requirements. That's considered an explanatory approach. So I'm calling this rather explanatory and giving it a Pressy 2 score of 2. Okay, recruitment. Um, how are the participants recruited into the trial? Well, they're, they're recruited when they come to this clinic, this Hypertension and Vascular Risk Unit at an academical medical center. And there's, oops, sorry, um, there's, um, there is um, fairly extensive testing done at baseline, including just to confirm eligibility. So here's this 48 hour continuous blood pressure monitoring. They also have to wear a mini motion logger actigraph on the wrist. This shows how active they were over those 48 hours. So I'm considering this very explanatory and call it, giving it a score of one. The setting is very explanatory. It's at one academic medical center. It consists of patients sent for evaluation to the Hypertension and Vascular Risk Unit at University Clinical Hospital of Santiago de Compostela. Um, very explanatory, score of one. And um, the... Uh, Expertise needed and resources needed um, at the organization. Well, one thing they need is they need to have the ability to administer and analyze the ABPM and the mini motion logger, including the devices, software, and training. So I'm calling that rather explanatory with a score of two. In terms of delivery of the intervention, uh, it's pretty straightforward. They're randomized to either all antihypertensive agents on awakening or at least one at bedtime. And physicians have some flexibility, a fair amount of flexibility to choose medications from the list of approved drug classes. These are approved by the study team. So I'm calling that rather pragmatic and giving it a score of four. In terms of special measures to ensure compliance by the participants, there is pre-screening of participants to evaluate their adherence to interventions and patients who are judged to potentially not be adherent are excluded. That's definitely explanatory. But then once the trial's underway, there are no special measures. So I'm calling that equally pragmatic and explanatory for a score of three. In, term of, in terms of special follow-ups to follow the patients, that extensive testing done at baseline, they're repeating that each year or more often if they adjust the medications and there's follow-up by the family doctor between visits I'm saying that's a lot of testing. I'm saying that's rather explanatory, so giving it a score of two. Primary outcome, and how relevant is this to participants and other stakeholders? Well, this is broken into two parts. The first part is evaluating the prognostic value of the ABPM versus blood pressure measured in clinic. That's definitely explanatory. And then, um, then there's assessing whether bedtime is better than morning. That's, that's straightforward. But given this here, I'm call and then there's a lot of car uh, cardiovascular events, including in the definition of morbidity and mortality. I'm calling this rather explanatory with a score of two. And finally, the last, last domain is, is primary analysis. To what extent are all data included? Well, this is doing an intention to treat analysis of all available data. That's actually very pragmatic. So it gets a score of five. By the way, intention to treat analysis is where you compare people in the groups to which they're randomized 
even if they cross over to the other side. That's the most valid way to analyze the data, and that's actually true for any trial. But uh, so a score of five on this one. So let's map this and see how it looks. And there we are. And this is a, a quite explanatory trial. Most of the values are, are low. Um, so that's a pretty explanatory trial. So now we want to look at how would we do this in a more um, pragmatic way. So this trial has addressed an important question with a striking result, a greater than 50% reduction in major cardiovascular events by taking blood pressure medications in the morning, I mean at bedtime. However, it is quite explanatory, so it would be useful to do a pragmatic trial to confirm this outcome, confirm this result in the broader setting of usual clinical care. So now we're going we're gonna to work on that. So we would like you to brainstorm this. Now, the way we've got this set up, so I think you've got the worksheets, and everyone is, um, everyone is um, got their table numbered, so that's your group number. And, um, and on your worksheet, each of these domains is numbered. So you do the, you work on the domain uh, associated with your, um, with your group number. And our folks in Regina, I believe, are splitting into two groups. I believe you are groups one and two. And so we would like to, and we're just gonna say, because um, uh, we got a little over half hour, so I think we can take, do you think 10 minutes or 15 minutes to, what do you think, 10 minutes? 12, 12 minutes. Okay, but perfect answer. That's, that's a very pragmatic. Uh, like, <laughs> so we'll take 12 minutes and please just brainstorm. And remember the key, the key things here are that um, key points about pragmatic trials. They take place within the context of routine clinical practice. They're, as un, they're unobtrusive to participants and clinicians and they address questions important to a variety of stakeholders. Um, so please just kind of brainstorm that and we'll, we'll reconvene in 12 minutes. Um, okay, so we did inclusion and exclusion criteria. And so we basically just uh, relaxed all the uh, criteria for inclusion and exclusion. Um, so basically if you're over 18 years of age and your doctor thinks you should be taking a, a you're a candidate for uh, blood pressure medications, you can probably be enrolled. Um, and I think we changed like the measurement of a 24 ambulatory blood pressure monitoring to the office blood pressure. Um, maybe I'm not sure when, what the end point is, maybe like, you know, 20, like a day or two after starting this. I'm, I'm not sure. Um, it doesn't really matter if you're deemed resistant or not. Um, and yeah, that's what we had. Okay, that's great. Uh, good thoughts. And we actually have some duplicates here. So we also have a, a, a group number one here uh, on site. So let's give them an opportunity to. I'll hand you the mic so that people online can hear you. So we relaxed things a little bit more. And we went with solely inclusion criteria. And our only inclusion criteria is that the patients are taking a blood pressure medication or about to start a blood pressure medication. That's it. No, in, no other inclusion and no exclusion. So age, not a factor, no factors. Okay, thank you. Very, very pragmatic. Um, okay, let's go to group two. And I believe we also, we have a group two in Regina as well. Is that right? Okay. Okay, let's do a uh, group two here. Group two here. Um, who's going to speak? Okay. Uh, we sort of had a conversation too to figure out what we were supposed to be answering. And it looked like we maybe overlapped quite a bit with the criteria, the inclusion exclusion criteria. Um, so some of these may be a little bit overlapping, but uh, the first thing was these participants were recruited from a pretty specific unit. So from the hospital, from the hypertension and vascular risk unit. And we thought about in kind of broadening the, the recruitment to a community-based recruitment or um, 
more uh, broad healthcare providers, so nurse practitioners or other forms of healthcare. So it's not just that um, that exclusive kind of group. Um, and then we weren't sure about all these baseline measures if they, I mean, they're, they're very valid, but are they very pragmatic? Probably not. That's a lot of stuff to have your participants go through. And perhaps, although less valid, there may be uh, easier tools for assessing some of these things like self-report or previous medical records, things like that. So they're not going through quite this many baseline procedures. Um, I don't know. Was there anything else? That was kind of it, hey? Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, thank you. That was great. Um, so, um, give uh, one more opportunity. To, is there a group two in Regina? Okay, I guess Regina was just group one. So let's go to group three here. And I didn't mention that you had two items under number three. I don't know if you picked up on that, but they're related: setting and organization. Sure. Okay, Regina. Are you able to hear me? Yes, we hear you. Okay, perfect. <laughs> um, so yeah, so we did number two as well. So we thought um, primarily what we focused on was expanding recruitment um, beyond the hypertension and vascular risk unit. So we thought that would get a very um, specific segment of the population, people who are probably worse off. Um, so we thought, Recruitment could really be expanded to um, potentially family doctors. There might be posters put up at the pharmacy. People, they may even be able to advertise and people could self-refer. And then the, the study coordinator could do the screening. So we thought uh, really broadening that. Um, in terms of the baseline data, we were less sure about. Um, we thought maybe things like the six clinic BP measurements um, weren't necessarily necessary, but um, not well, having we'll the, like, the oh, There we go. Can you hear me? Okay, we're yeah. Am I cutting out? Yeah, yeah, you have been. We hear you now. Okay. Um, so well, I'm not sure how much you heard. Um, well, um, about expanding uh, expanding enrollment, and and um, um, putting out the word more broadly. Yeah. Um, so in terms of the baseline data, um, we just weren't sure what is strictly necessary, um, I guess not having the background in cardiology, but things like um, six clinic BP measurements, for example, like that could be loosened. So, so some of those might be able to be revisited, but we primarily focused on the, um, the participants' recruitment. And that's great. That really is the focus on that item. Okay, thank you. Great. All right, let's move to uh, group three. Um, looking at setting and organization. Thank you, Scott. Um, we were a bit confused with this, uh, but we went by making certain assumptions um, that this trial is going to happen at the vascular risk unit at Compostela. Is that how you say it? So um, looking at, uh, we thought that if we are assessing pragmatism by ease of conducting the trial and adherence or compliance from the patients to stick on to this trial, um, we thought that patients who won't be able to visit this center, probably we could add something like mobile data collection using smartphone apps for the blood pressure versus wearing that monitor uh, and also um, utilizing e uh, telehealth or e-health facilities. Um, or maybe it lies with the local pharmacy or the the respective um, nurses or some small clinics that are available in different towns versus making people come to the center. Like we went by the assumption that it may not be easy for some of the people to come and things like that. So going by that, we made these recommendations to make it more pragmatic, but having worked on certain trials uh, when uh, it becomes necessary for people to monitor the 24-hour urine sample and ABPM for ease of running the trial. And sometimes it makes sense that it's all collected at a central place versus multiple just for the ease of running a trial. So we were kind of on the wall. We were not very sure of whether it's really kind of 
you know probably we could add some of these elements that's what we thought yeah thank you okay thank you and and a real emphasis on real world evidence there which is a great thought okay group 4 which is flexibility both in delivery and adherence. I'll see. Uh, so for uh, the first one, it already is rather pragmatic, but I guess we were thinking they could just remove the randomization, allow them to pick when they want to take it, as long as obviously they report what time they take it at. Um, and then for the second one, we noticed we had two. So flexibility, adherence. Um, we said that you'd, we'd re remove the first portion of the requirement as the pre-screening to evaluate adherence to intervention, so we would not have that pre-screening. Okay, great. Thank you. And uh, yeah, that's a uh, um, good uh, pragmatic thought. The randomization, again, you know, we, our recommendation is to include randomization in any trial because it's so essential to removing bias. But on the other hand, that would be a very pragmatic approach. So group five is... Um, so it's follow-up um, on this patient. So uh, what we started um, to say is as often as the doctor will recommend it because this is a population that it can be um, not that high, very high, in the middle, so it depends what the needs are for the patient. Okay, great, and that sounds like that would be essentially standard of care because it would depend on the patient's condition. So great, that's very pragmatic. And uh, group six is primary outcome. So I'm, we weren't sure that the prognostic value of ABPM versus clinical BP would be of interest to the participants. It's more or less like, what is my BP? Um, so just looking at that. And then the cardiovascular morbidity and morb mortality maybe can be more inclusive. It can be like, why not just anything? You know, what, what is the concern to the patient when they come in to see the doctor? Great. I would uh, definitely agree with that. That's definitely the more pragmatic approach. Um, obviously, we didn't do uh, the last domain because that's already very pragmatic. So um, thanks, everyone, for that. That was uh, very good. And um, so just as our kind of last step here, so let's look at this current trial that is a pragmatic trial. Um, let's see, we're going to brighten up here. There we go. There is a pragmatic trial addressing this question. So let's look at that and just see what they came, came up with in the design of their trial. This is called the BEDMED trial. And um, this is a pragmatic trial being done looking at the same question. Um, and it's being done by the Pragmatic Trials Cooperative at the University of Alberta. And that's being done in conjunction with our, Al with our Alberta SPORE partners. And uh, it's, it's called the High Blood Pressure Study, or BEDMED. And, um, and it is a, a pragmatic trial studying the effect of antihypertensive medication timing. And um, it's being carried out by uh, physicians in Alberta, British Columbia, and Manitoba. And actually, they're in the process now of recruiting physicians from Saskatchewan as well. So it's nice. It's close to home. So let's look at their attributes and compare them with the MAPEC study and also what we came up with here. So um, for eligibility, um, well, they've loosened it up a lot. There's still a few eligibility criteria, but it's quite used. It does involve just adults, so at least 19 years old, and there does need to be a hypertension diagnosis, um, and they do need to be on a blood pressure medication. But uh, it's, it's pretty wide open, and actually it's a requirement they be in the community, in a community dwelling, and that could include assisted living. So that's quite pragmatic. Um, and then um, for the exclusion criteria, it's just three. And one is that you have to have at least a life expectancy of at least two years and be able to provide informed consent, which is obviously essential. 
One, one interesting thing is that you're excluded if you have a personal history of glaucoma or use of glaucoma medications, and that's because there's been some question about when you take your blood pressure medications at bedtime, that means you have this, what they call a dip in blood pressure in the night. And there's been some concern that that might be related to aggravating glaucoma. So that is why they've included that. But I would still say this is very pragmatic. It's quite a wide open um, um, uh, eligibility. For recruitment, in terms of how people are recruited, well, there are special steps taken. It's not just in the routine course of healthcare, but they're quite unobtrusive. So um, things are done by phone. They call people. You don't have to come into the clinic uh, and, and, uh, um, when you're being approached. And um, you can even do uh, some of the interviews by online survey, amazingly. And uh, there is an initial visit to review medications, but a lot, the Bracine data are largely taken from real-world evidence, from, uh, from claims data. So I'm, I'm calling this rather, rather pragmatic, actually. A couple extra steps, but it is rather pragmatic with a score of four. The setting is very pragmatic. This is just uh, over 300 Canadian family physicians uh, across the, these provinces. And uh, basically, any hypertensive uh, primary care patients are included. And so I, I'd say that's very pragmatic. And then the uh, setting is identical to usual care, so very pragmatic with a score of five. Um, there is randomization, but it's, again, very simple. It's either you take your meds in the morning or bedtime. And, um, and um, all decisions related to uh, the choice of medications, switching medications are at the discretion of the care provider. So lots of flexibility. I'd say very pragmatic again. In terms of uh, measures to ensure adherence, um, there aren't any. So again, very pragmatic. Score of five. Um, follow-ups. There are follow-up visits, but they're relatively unobtrusive. Um, and they're done by phone at for week one, week six. And after six months, you can even do it by email. So that's quite unobtrusive. And then again, uh, as with the baseline data, a lot, the data largely come from real-world evidence. So I'm calling this rather pragmatic with a score of four. And the primary outcome, um, let me just switch to this one. The primary outcome consists of a composite endpoint of several elements. Now, these certainly are of concern to patients. Now, sometimes a composite endpoint, which is combining a bunch of things like this, is considered explanatory, particularly if some of the components aren't really of interest to participants, but I would say these would be. Um, so um, I think that's pretty pragmatic. And also notice the additional outcomes that they're including in this study, such as acute care costs, uh, quality of life, self-reported worsening of vision. Interesting other endpoints they're following, which would be of interest to a variety of stakeholders. I'm saying, even though it is a composite endpoint, I'm saying this is rather pragmatic. Okay, could be could be debated whether that's uh, that's very pragmatic or not. But I'm saying a score of four. And the primary analysis, same as the MAPEC study, very pragmatic, intention to treat analysis of all available data. So um, let's look at our Pressy 2 wheel. Two minutes left. Okay, here we go. And here's our bed med trial. And um, notice how that's a, a highly pragmatic trial. And um, so um, comparing our, our BedMed2 Pressy wheel with our MAPEC Pressy wheel, we see now that um, we have uh, two studies addressing this question, one quite explanatory and one highly pragmatic, looking at this question of whether um, blood, blood pressure medication should be taken at bedtime. And it will be very interesting to see what the outcome is with the BedMed study. One last point to make. And that's getting back to patient-oriented research. And, um, and of course, we, it's very important to emphasize that it's important to include that patient and family perspective as an integral role in all clinical trials, whether they're explanatory or pragmatic, makes no difference. That's such an important 
part. This is what BedMed is doing to include the patient and family voice. They have a 10 member patient working group and that group it reviews and edits all of the study material as well as the website and marketing materials. They participate in interviewing research assistants uh, in presentations at conferences. They troubleshoot recruitment issues and they participate in getting the word up, out about the study in knowledge translation. And the final word is to stay tuned for a future Skipper workshop about incorporating the patient and family perspective in your studies. So thank you very much. Hi everyone, I just have a couple closing remarks here. So please watch your inbox for a survey from us to get your feedback about the event uh, and also to receive the slides that Scott presented today. And just a couple thank yous. So thank you for everyone who's here in person. Thanks to everyone who joined us on WebEx and the technology worked okay. So that was nice to see. Um, thanks to everyone who helped organize the event, so all the Skipper staff, and anyone from the CTSU, thank you so much. And then lastly, thank you to Scott. That was great, uh, really well done, and that was, that was awesome. So uh, round of applause for Scott. Uh, and for everyone in person, there is some coffee and snacks at the back, so please help yourself before you leave. <laughs>